Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is James Stewart. I'm a systems administrator here at Penn State. Uh, I work uh, basically 100% on the Windows side. I have nothing to do with Macs whatsoever, but I use Macs at home. And I, you know, have more recently gotten more into doing Mac administrative stuff. Um, but that is my, uh, my background is primarily in Windows. So whenever I switch, I'm constantly switching between the Mac and Windows, and it kind of drives me crazy because all of a sudden I can't remember how to copy and paste for a few seconds, and then uh, my fingers get used to it, and then I switch back, and then I'm confused all over again, uh, which is lots of fun. Um, today we're going to be talking about the intro to the command line. Um, the idea here is to really get you a little bit more comfortable with the command line, uh, get you a little bit more used to it if you've never used it before. Um, and to, um, you know, really get you started uh, down the road of using the command line. Um, a lot of you may think, you know, what, what is, how useful is the command line to me uh, in general, or, oh, I already know how to do some of these same things in a different way, so why would I do it this way? And the main thing I would uh, stress is that being comfortable with the command line is sort of the first step towards automating tasks to understanding how to repeat tasks or how to use, um, you know, scripts and other things that are going to be talked about here at this conference. Um, this talk will actually lead into a talk immediately following this, which is going to be an intro to scripting. So it will show you sort of how to take what you've learned here and apply it in a more useful way to doing administrative tasks on your uh, machine. Um, the, the command line really means a lot of different things. Um, you know, sometimes it's called the command line, the command line interface. What, it, what we're really talking about is a text-based way to interact with your machine. Uh, you type in commands and then the machine responds. Uh, often it responds and says you did something wrong and it doesn't like it. Other times it does exactly what you, um, uh, you know, expect it to. And sometimes there's a little bit of trial and error and um, getting things going. Uh, on the Mac, um, the application that you actually interact with the terminal typically, it, or the command line, is uh, terminal.app. Um, and uh, I'm going to open that on all your machines now if it's not already open. So you should see it open on all of that. So here it is. This is the terminal application that we're going to be interacting with. Um, and this is where you are basically going to type commands to follow along with what I'm talking about. And I will uh, show you up here as well uh, so that you can follow along with uh, you know, what I'm presenting. Oh, and please uh, feel free to interrupt me with questions. Um, don't wait till the end. Um, I would like this to be a little bit more participatory, uh, and you know, hopefully, you guys can follow along. It should be Mountain Lion. It should be the latest. Yeah, ten eight three. All right. Many of you may not realize this, but the Mac OS is based on Unix. It has a sort of interesting lineage. Um, Unix was one of the first operating systems. Uh, it was invented in uh, AT&T Bell Laboratory. Uh, and many different projects actually led up to what is now OS X. Um, if, you got, if any of you have used the old classic Mac interface, that is actually not based on Unix, but the new OS X is. And the main point I want to convey is that learning the command line on OS X or Unix or Linux are typically identical. Most of what you do will work exactly the same. And if you become comfortable with the command line and using it and scripting with it, you will know how to do that on essentially every single operating system except for Windows, of course. Uh, Windows is the only one that does not use uh, the same style command line uh, as OS X. Um, by default, Linux and Unix. Um, technically, Android is built on Linux, and there is actually a way to enable command line capabilities on Android. Now, it's not usually 
something that you would normally do. Your phones, you know, they, they don't really allow you to open the command line. But it's actually kind of there, and there is a way to get to it. Uh, usually you have to install something. But um, almost every device that we interact with in the world is running Linux or Unix, and in the case of Mac OS, you know, based on Unix. So this is potentially helpful in many different scenarios. And one thing that we don't realize necessarily is that um, you know, our routers, our Wi-Fi devices, these are all running Linux. Our, um, in the future, our smart devices, our smart cars, our smart toaster ovens, our smart refrigerators, they're all going to be running embedded Linux. Um, this command line is often the only way that those, that those kind of devices are interacted with by the people designing and interacting with them and having to control them or fix them. So you may all be Mac admins now, but someday you might be toaster administrators or um, refrigerator administrators, and you're going to do that through the command line because there will be no other way to interact with it in the most in most cases. Um, and mo all of the things that we're going to be going over today are the basics, and they will work identically on all of these systems. So. It's not just about learning Mac OS, it's really about learning the command line and what that means. So um, I just wanted to convey that, that there is uh, a little bit more going on here than just OS X. I wanted to answer this question of why does this matter. Um, when you're starting out with the command line, things are not always quickly going, and when you're not comfortable with it, um, you know, it's, it's hard to really step in there and really uh, try to accomplish tasks using the command line when you feel like you'd rather do it a different way. There are some operations that can only be done on the command line, and they cannot be done anywhere else. Um, now, sometimes the reverse is true. It's usually, it, there are certain things where it's possible to do it through interacting with a machine, and it's very difficult or impossible to do it through interacting with the command line. But it does kind of go both ways. Um, it typically used to be that, um, you know, th there was always a way to do it through the command line, and there was only sometimes a way to do it with the, um, actually interacting with the keyboard and mouse, and um, that has changed a little bit in the modern era, just because we've come so far since the command line was the only interface available. Um, almost all automation starts with the command line. Um, when you can create a set of commands to automate something and push that out to all your machines at once using something like ARD or um, running scripts remotely or many other management um, pieces of software use scripting in the background or use the command line in the background to actually accomplish their tasks. Um, that, that is almost always the basis where things start and then you kind of build automation on top of interacting with the, with the command line. Um, one huge advantage of command line operations in general are that once you have figured out how to do it, you can sort of bundle up that operation and then repeat it over and over again, and you can send that to someone else and they can do the same, uh, which is immensely helpful. Um, one of the really, really extremely helpful things is being able to share not only how you did something or why you did something or documenting how to do it, but also have the actual steps in a script that you can hand off to someone and actually say, run this, see what happens, you will see what I did. You will un and you will be able to sort of understand what I did. Um, and again, that means that uh, batch operations are uh, much simpler, which really means if I wanted to repeat the exact same task on every single machine in this room, over and over again and have the same, do the exact same thing, um, bundling up a bunch of command line operations in a script and sending it off is definitely the way that I would want to do that. Uh, and also the way that I opened uh, the Google Doc on all of your Safari instances uh, in front of you and open up the terminal on your machine is through the command line. That's how I did that. Uh, so, uh, you know, I opened up 30 tabs in, in Safari and opened up 30 copies of Terminal in this room all at once. And I did it by interacting with the command line. Of course, I did it by sending a command line command to all of your machines 
you know, through uh, management. But that is, um, you know, the goal here is that hopefully you'll be able to use this, uh, what I'm teaching you to better administrate multiple machines at once. Uh, but also be able to uh, administer just the machine in front of you in a different sort of way. Are there any questions at this point? Oh, thanks for whoever put, is putting some links in uh, the Google Doc. That's very handy. Nice. Well, sorry about that. I guess there is a maximum user limit. That's good to know. Yeah, I figured that that might be an issue. I've never tried that, you know, having a huge number of people all in there at once. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out, um, actually, I'm not sure if I can look this. Oh, okay, so your your machines, they, they have something called single user mode, which is essentially a command line only way to interact with the machine. You can actually reboot into single user mode on any Mac. And that is often what you do when things break, when things are when things are going wrong. That's what you often do, and that means you're interacting with the, the only thing available to you is the command line. There's nothing else. It's just the command line, and you got to figure out how to fix stuff. Uh, if there's like a graphical problem or some other um, thing going wrong, it's kind of on the Windows side. I think of it kind of like safe mode. Uh, I don't know if any of you. How many of you deal with Windows here, actually, in, in one way or the other? Yeah. You notice I said deal with, not enjoy administrator. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're two different things. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of like the Windows command line only safe mode. That's the kind of idea. All right. Um, Terminal.app should be open on all of your machines. It probably does not look exactly like that because now it's uh, white. Uh, so this terminal here. This used to be all there was. So long ago, before the full user interface and the finder and the desktop and all the fancy stuff we have now, there was only the terminal. There was only the command line. That's all there was. There was nothing else. And often you were interacting with a terminal, which literally means a keyboard and mouse and nothing else that was connecting to a server and lots of other people were doing the same thing. And you were all remote logged on to one device and all interacting with it simultaneously. Uh, through different logons. Um, so th this actually used to be the only interface, the only interface that there was. There was the terminal and nothing else. And there, uh, on the Windows side, there was DOS, and that was their version of the terminal. Um, so this application actually emulates that terminal experience and allows you to interact with that command line. So th that command line is sort of hidden beneath the GUI that's, that you're not really thinking about, that you're not really interacting with directly most of the time that you're on a Macintosh, it's still there, and Terminal.app gives you access to it. And um, there are actually different kinds of terminals, um, many different kinds, and the, the Terminal.app is actually able to emulate different kinds of those terminals. Um, kind of a little, little bit beyond the scope of this, uh, but I just want you to know that there's a bit more going on behind the scenes than you might realize at first. Uh, how many of you have um, used computers when they only had a text interface? Yeah, I, that's that's where I got my start as well. It was a uh, very different time, I would say. That, um, how many of you played text-based games? Nice, nice. Well, that is kind of like interacting on the command line. There's a syntax, there's commands, you have to figure out what they are, you have to figure out you know, what they do and how they work together, what happens when you do one and then do the next and then do the next after that. So a uh, text-based game is actually a very similar analog to using the command line. The generic syntax to using the command line, um, this is just kind of a quick overview. You have uh, a one-word command. It's always one word. It, there cannot be any space in the command. Um, there are different options to sort of modify how that command works. Those are almost always optional. And then there are parameters that you specify after that. Um, that's kind of the terminology that we use when we're talking about the command line. Um, there's the command that you want to use, which is kind of what you want to do. And then the parameters are what you want to do that to, or 
um, what you want to actually perform the operation on. And options sort of modify the way the command works. Uh, sometimes a command may only work on one file, but maybe you want to work on every file in a directory. Well, sometimes you specify an option, and then that causes it to work on all of the files simultaneously. Um, spaces are important. Spaces typically mark the, um, you know, if you're typing the first word, that's your command. Um, and then you put, you put a space. And that signifies the end of that command. And then you put, you know, your options and in, in the space after each one of those or, or a space after those. And then you have parameters and a space parameter. Um, so spaces are, are important. Spaces matter. Spaces are a problem if they are within your file name or within your directory name that you're trying to operate on. You cannot just type a space because that it will the command line interprets that as the end of the of the command or the end of the parameter. Uh, so you have to um, escape the space so that it can interpret that as an actual space within the parameter rather than um, a space meaning the end of a parameter. Uh, this is an example right here, which you could actually um, type in to the terminal right now. Um, so what this will do actually create the file on your desktop with the space. But if I did this without that character, that special character, I would actually get this file. Because it interpreted the space here as the end of what I was saying. And so it did not create the file that I expect. That was a good question. It was very hard to see. I agree. Oh, you mean here. Is that more easily read now? Okay, good. So you can kind of see that there's a difference here. The, the two different files that these commands created um, based upon the presence or lack of this. Uh, then there's also the complication that if you actually want this character in the name of the file, um, you cannot actually do it quite like that. So you notice that this does not actually have that escaped character in there, and that's because um, it, it's, a, it's expecting there to be a character after it that it needs to um, think about in a special way to uh, actually have it show up. So what you actually have to do in that case is you actually have to type it twice. And now it'll show up in there. It's a little bit hard to see, but there it is. Uh, I mostly meant this as an overview of this uh, concept because uh, it is important. Uh, why uh, of, of like why spaces aren't going to work when you're trying things out uh, as we go forward? Uh, I think this is definitely something to come back to. Um, any questions about this? All right. One of the first commands I wanted to talk about today was the, the man or manual command. Definitely one of the most important. This essentially allows you to access documentation that's built into the command line about the different commands. So if you um, actually type in man, man, this will bring up this documentation that's telling you how to use this command. And this command is the command that tells you how to use other commands. So this is a very fundamental piece. And this is available to you at any time, anywhere. To get out of this, you actually type Q. That's very important. So if you hit Q, you will get out of that and go back to the terminal. Uh, but then you can 
type it again, and get back into it. And it'll actually describe how to do each command, which is uh, extremely, extremely helpful. So whenever people say, like, read the man page, this is what they're talking about. They're saying, use man space and then the command that you are interested in using, and then read about that command. Uh, you can actually look these up online as well, so you actually don't need to be in front of a computer that's capable of doing this. You don't actually have to be in front of a command line to access this documentation. Uh, but it's extremely helpful for uh, whenever you're using a new command for the first time. Uh, and you, even if you're trying to use a, a particular operation of a command or a particular option of a command that you've never used before, uh, also extremely helpful for that. This is the first command that I want to, that, uh, the command that actually does something. Um, the pwd command is, stands for print working directory. The directory that you are in at the time when you're doing operations matter. If you're going to create a file and you don't specify where to create it, it will create it in your current directory or your, your working directory. Your working directory is like kind of like your base of operations. When you're in the finder and you have the finder open, Wherever you are, it's showing that to you, and you see that context of where you are. And if you right-click and hit create a new folder, it's going to create that new folder where you are in the finder. But in the command line, you don't necessarily have that context apparent to you while you're there. So you don't necessarily know where you are unless you ask it, where am I? Or if I've been changing what directory I'm in many times, then I... Um, may no longer realize or have a full context of where I am. So if I type in pwd, this is, this is actually, since I have not changed directories at all, this is what's called my home folder, um, slash users, slash, and then my username. So this gives me the context of where I am, and I know that unless I specify exactly where to put to, to do something, this is where it's going to happen. Um, And this is a command that you can use, you know, at any time to just kind of get your bearings and get an idea of where I am at within the system. Although it does occur to me that how many how many of you work with paths on a regular basis, full paths like this? I mean, have I guess how many of you are not used to seeing this this sort of syntax right here? Right, right. We're actually going to talk about paths more later. Uh, but that's very important, is uh, paths and what they mean. The next command that I want to talk about is um, the list directory contents, or ls. This essentially shows you what files are in the directory that you're currently in. So in, when you have the finder open to a particular directory, it's going to show you what files and folders are there in that window. But in the terminal, it does not show you what's there by default. You know, when you change directories, it just says, okay, it's, it, you're somewhere else now. But you, it's up to you to figure out, like, okay, well, where is this location with print working directory, and what's here with ls? So on the in command line, like, you really have to say, where am I, and show me what's here. It's not going to do that for you. You actually have to ask the question. So we'll, when I type in ls, we will see that I am um, in this, uh, like, the, the, I'm in my home folder, and these are the folders that are available in that home folder. And there's also a file here. Um, so now I know what is in the directory that I am in. Exactly. This is This is... If you're used to the Windows command line, this is exactly equivalent to DIR. Or perhaps not exactly, but very, very, very close. Um, if you are coming from the Windows command line and you are familiar with the Windows command line, it does help to know what the equivalent is. And there are cheat sheets out there that will kind of give you, like, here are the Windows commands, here are the Unix commands that 
um, helped you make that jump. How many of you are very familiar with the Windows command line and here because you're interested in the Mac command line specifically? Okay. Good number of you. It's good to know. Okay, if you want to switch which directory you're you're located in, you use the cd command to actually make that change or change directory. So whatever your current directory is, um, the cd command will allow you to switch to a different directory. So, uh, you know, I, I print working directory will tell me where I'm at. ls will tell me what's available. Change directory. I type in a directory that is uh, within there and hit enter. I am now in that directory. So if I type in print working directory, you can see that I'm now somewhere else. I'm, I'm now no longer in where I was before. I'm now in the desktop folder. And then if I type in ls to see what is here, I will see different things. Um, your desktop's may be blank. I'm not sh certain. Uh, so you may you may actually not get any results. Uh, if you are in an empty directory and you type in ls, there just won't be anything. It won't tell you anything, and that's because it's empty. It doesn't tell you that it's empty, it just tells you nothing. Um, and then um, another thing that I can do is if I type in cd and then nothing else and hit, and hit return, I will return to my home directory. That is the default directory, and when I type in cd and nothing else, I return to my default. So now... If I type in print working directory, I'm back to where I was before, in my default home directory. Uh, and again, the desktop is available, so if I do CD desktop, now I'm back to where I was. Um, you can also do CD dot dot, and that takes you back one level. So um, at any time, CD dot dot takes you to the previous, or the next higher up directory. So I was in a, in the desktop directory, which was under my home directory, and I did cd dot dot, so I jumped back up to my home directory. Um, that is a good question. I believe you do. Yeah. It, and it's because of a command is always that first word, and if there isn't that space, then it thinks you're trying to run the command cd dot dot with no space, which is not a command that exists. But cd space dot dot is do the cd command and do it to the dot dot directory which means the previous directory. Um, cd dot dot without a space in Windows is technically an alias of the cd command I believe. I don't believe it's a real thing. I think what they're doing is they're sending that back to the cd command with cd space dot dot. I think that's how they're tricking that to actually work. I'm th Right, exactly. And so there are definitely some differences here. The next command I want to talk about is the make directory command, or mkdir. Um, this is how you create a new directory through the terminal or through the command line. Um, in the finder, you're probably used to right-clicking. Well, right-clicking is a weird term on a Mac. Uh, bringing up the option menu and clicking new folder, or using a keyboard shortcut, or using... Uh, I don't know, one of those menus on the top that I never use. <laughs> um, I, I never even thought about now that I should not use the word right click on a Mac, because that doesn't make sense necessarily. To me, I, it drives me crazy that there is not a right click, and I always figure out a way to get that back. All right, so... Um, actually, I'm going to show the desktop over here. And uh, right now I am in my desktop. If you're not in your desktop, you might want to go there so you can kind of see this. Uh, and then if I take make the IR space and then the folder that I want to create, let's call it new folder, why not? Um, now it's actually created this folder on my desktop. Uh, so there it is. Uh, I've created this new folder. Um, and then I can say you know, what's here, and now there's this folder here that wasn't here before, 
And now I can do cd new folder. And it's empty. There's nothing in it because I just created it. But now I'm actually in that folder. So now I have, I have actually am at this new folder that I created. Uh, see some of you are still clicking along. You mean, you mean you create it on the in the home folder? Okay, so in that case, what you could do is um, just type in cd and hit enter. Uh, that's going to take you back to your home directory. Type ls, and then it's going to list you all of the directories in that location, and then you will see it. And that is where it's going to go by default. So if you weren't already in your desktop folder, that's where it's going to go. Um, the main reason I'm trying to do things based on the desktop is it's kind of handy because you can actually see those things be created while you're sitting there staring at it if you can see the side of your screen, which is kind of nice. Um, but yes, uh, by default it's going to go in your user directory and yeah, then you can just take a look. So, um, you know, if I did this, now it's going to show up here under my user directory and I'm not going to see it quite as well. Um, All right, the next um, thing we're going to talk about, which I did demonstrate a little bit with um, uh, the escape character, is touch. Touch will, it, it does what it says, it touches a file. And it updates the access time and modification times of that file. It say, it's basically saying, I, I touch the file, and by touching the file, I've accessed it and... Um, potentially modified it, so those timestamps are updated. What is, why am I telling you about this? Not because of that, because that is kind of complicated, and don't worry about that. But what it does is if a file does not exist, it creates it. So if, you, if, if there is not a file on your machine, and it, it does not yet exist, but you want to create a file of that name and then edit it and you know add text to it or something like that, um, one way to do that is to actually create the file that will be empty and then edit it and add stuff to it. Um, and the touch command is one way to create a file. Uh, sometimes th there are other reasons why it will just create an empty file and it will just be there. Uh, but this is ha one of the ways to do it through the command line. So if I go to my uh, desktop, and I sort of already demonstrated this, but if I type in touch, and then a file that does not exist, like, I don't know, some gibberish.txt. Um, this will now show up on my desktop. So there it is. Uh, but then if I um, do that same command again, uh, exactly, and hit it again, it's not going to create that file again. It's not, it's not going to overwrite that file. What it's actually going to do is it's going to update these times here. Um, so if I did the same thing to this one, what it's actually done is it's um, the creation time was back when I created it, but the modification time and last open time has been changed to the current time. So that's what it's actually done. So it'll create a file. If it doesn't exist, if it does exist, it'll change this. Uh, and, and sometimes that is a way, like if you wanted to know when the last time you ran a script was, you could touch a file, and that file's last modification date will be the last time that script ran. So you could have an empty file that has nothing in it and is a, n a name of, like, last run, and just touch that file at the end of every script, and you will know when that script is last run. Um, there's whole lots of other reasons why you would use this command, but that's one example that I can give. Um, but it's, you know, for showing how to create files, it's useful for this. Well, we're getting there. 
Yeah. No, not yet, but we're getting there. We haven't even gotten to deleting files yet, so this is creating files. Soon we'll talk about deleting files. Uh, open is uh, essentially as if you had double-clicked on that file or folder, do the same thing. So if you say open and then specify a file, it'll open that file similarly as if you had double-clicked on it. If you say open a folder, it'll open that folder in Finder similar to how if you were to double-click on a folder and open it. Um, and then you can actually use the same thing with a URL. Uh, and that's actually how I opened the Google Doc on all of those machines. I said open and I specified the URL and I hit go. And it basically told the operating system, take this thing after this open command and, and open it the way you would by default. You know, do whatever you would do. So if I say open and then a, a .txt file, it's going to open up whatever your default .txt file editor is and open that file within it on your machine. If I say open and then a URL, it should open your default browser, whatever that is. It does not have to be Safari, I believe. Um, it's possible it only opens Safari, but I think it opens the default. Uh, but uh, And then if you say open a folder, it's going to open Finder in that location. Um, I think so, too. Yeah. The same way it does whenever you double click on a file, um, the operating system usually has like a, a listing of applications that have uh, registered themselves as capable of opening that. And there one is the default and it's usually whatever it was at first. Uh, but then like you open up Firefox and it says, would you like me to make you the default browser, me the default browser? And you say yes and now it's the default. And now whenever you open up a URL, it should open in Firefox and not Safari. Or in my case, Google Chrome and not Firefox because uh, don't like Firefox anymore. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it's, it's using the same system of defaults that's built into the operating system that you're using every single day and you don't realize it. it it'll open in whatever the default unspecified file is. Like, if you have a file and it does not specify an extension or a type or anything like that, then it'll open in whatever the default thing is for nothing specified, which is usually a text editor. So if, if um, and it's actually a little bit confusing uh, with the Mac. The extensions used to not matter at all. It used to actually sort of hide a, a type of the file in the file system that said what to open it with. Now they kind of use a hybrid of extensions and that old system. So there actually there actually used to be something in there that would kind of say, oh, I'm this kind of file, and then the operating system would say, okay, how do I open this kind of file? And then it would figure that out uh, and open it. Um, Windows does the same thing. You can change the defaults uh, in Windows or the Mac for what should open what, you know, like well, how it, a particular file should be open. Yes. I don't know. I'm sure you can. Yeah, so that, that would be one way to do it. But the, but as far as making a new thing the default, there should be a way to do it in the command line. I'm not really aware of what that is. Yeah, well, the right-click open with will allow you to change how a file is opened. But there should be a command line equivalent to doing that. Uh, the command line equivalent to the open with is, like you said, to specify what application to open the file with. So uh, I believe the syntax for that is like open what you want to open and then the thing you want to open it with. I, I believe uh, I could just type in and open and it should tell me uh, somewhere in there. Yeah. You have to, yeah, here you go. You have to type dash a and then specify the application. So that's how you would do that from the command line. Uh, but if you want to actually change the default, that's uh, something else. Oh, um, if I type in open dot, what open dot does is say open the current folder. So um, I went to my user folder and I hit open dot, and so now it's opened my finder window to my home directory because that's the default. Uh, now if I type in... Ooh, Well, 
is already open, so it's not very exciting. Now it's open. So now it's opened it to my desktop, because I was in my desktop folder. I, I switched to my desktop folder. So the, this, I switched to this folder, and then I put open dot, which says open whatever the current folder is. And that is now open here in the finder. And I'm seeing my desktop. Uh, the little red X. <laughs> <laughs> Not from the terminal exactly. Um, I don't know if we're going to get into that, but if we have time, we can get into how to do that from the command line. Oh, you want to see an app opened up? Hmm. What? Well, uh, No, you don't, because you can specify op to open an app, I believe. Yeah, that's the issue. That requires more typing. <laughs> so, um, how I actually opened all of the terminal windows on all of these machines is I actually sent the command open, and then I did applications, utilities, terminal.app, which I don't know what this is going to do since I already have terminal open. I think it's not going to do anything at all. But that that is the command that I sent to all of your machines through ARD to open up terminal in the first place. So by, by sending that command, if terminal was not open, it would open it uh, on your machine. Uh, so you can actually specify open and then the location of an app. And then it'll do the equivalent of launching that application on the uh, this is probably the least helpful one imaginable. That's true, yeah. Well, what's, what's something else in utilities that's harmless? Yeah, there we go. So there, I just opened up Activity Monitor um, using that command. So it not only opens files and folders, but it'll open applications as well. All right, so the next command we're going to talk about is the copy command. It's uh, cp. Um, so you specify cp, the source file that you want to copy, and then the destination uh, file that you want to copy it to. Um, the file must exist at first. Um, if it doesn't, it will not work. So... So I'm on my desktop. Um, here there's a, a file called file, and I'm going to type cp file, and file.txt. And so now I have um, the file, the original, and I now have this new one called file.txt, which has the contents of file, but now is called file.txt, and they both exist separately. Um, so they're both there now. What was that? Ditto. All right. What's, what is it? Well, C, CP is a, is a built-in Unix command. I believe uh, there's other commands that do copy-like things, like xcopy, and I imagine ditto is one of them that are not necessarily a built-in Unix command and are not universally available on all... Um, command lines, but it may be built into the Mac and available on all Macs. Um, I'm, I'm not certain of um, Ditto. Right, yeah, there are more advanced copy commands that can do more. All right, the next is uh, the remove command, or delete. That's the way I like to think about it. Um, 
I guess it would be the Windows equivalent of DEL. Uh, and this is how you would remove a file. So I'm still in my desktop directory that has all these files that I've been creating. Uh, so if I type in rm file, now that is no longer there. So it exists. I said delete, remove it or delete it, and now it's not in here anymore. Yeah, gone, gone. Exactly. Uh, much closer to gone than in the trash. Um, so that would be how to remove a file. And then the move, the move command is um, sort of the equivalent of doing a copy and then deleting the original. So if you say, you know, copy file from file to file 2 and then delete file, move would be the same as saying move file to file 2. So it'll no longer exist in the original location, but it'll exist with the new name and the new location with all the same contents within it. So uh, I have, in this case, um, file.txt, and if I say move file.txt to file2.txt, um, the original file.txt no longer exists, but file2.txt now exists. Uh, and the contents that were originally there will uh, have moved along with it. That's coming up, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, RM only works on files. Um, uh, well, is it... Oh, I guess, yeah, I think you're right. I think there is a RM... Yeah, so if you do dash D, then it'll remove it. So if I have RM dash D in a new folder, that new folder that I created here is no longer there. So that's how you do that. I thought those were RM dir, but... Right, so there's that as well. Right. So it's, it's almost like a, an equivalent... Um, option. And, and the other way to think of uh, move, which I do say here, is to think of it as like a rename function, like rename the file to something else. Uh, but that's also the equivalent of doing like a copy and a remove. There's a lot of commands that um, you might do many different commands and you could achieve it all with one command if you knew that command. And this is an example, you know, if you were getting copy and then remove, you could just remove. So something that we haven't talked about but I have been using a little bit here is command line history, which is very helpful. If I want to go to any previous command that I've typed into the command line here, I can press the up arrow on the keyboard and it'll bring up that previous command. So I'm not actually typing in the command, I'm just hitting the up arrow. And I can scroll through all of the previous commands that I've done. Um, which is a lot of them. So I'm just, it should be as long as the session, but maybe a little bit shorter. <laughs> so, but I think if you, it, that's because it's restoring your command line session, I believe. I think if you're closing the terminal app and reopening it, then that's gone. Oh, it really, it is. Wow, okay. All right, so it's very forever then. A lot longer than I would have thought. It's very interesting. Um, yeah, so if I hit this again, 
that folder will be back. So I just scrolled through my past commands, I pulled up that make directory new folder, I want, ran it, and now that directory is back. So I've repeated a command from the past. All right, so I want to talk about a bit about paths. Paths are essentially how you specify where to do something on the machine. Um, everything on the Mac and Unix and Linux in general is all based around the root folder, which is slash. Everything is a subdirectory of that folder. Everything. Um, that is the where everything else is. And your default directory is always slash users slash your username slash and and everything below that folder um, and there's the tilde which is um, shift and then the button next to the one um, is is like a shortcut to your home folder a shortcut alias to that folder so um, these three these three down here these three paths these are all equivalent essentially um, there there is a difference in the fact that if you're not the same current user, you're going to get your current user desktop. You're not going to get someone else's current user desktop. Uh, and if it, in this down here, if you're specifying your, the current user, you're going to get the same location. But you could actually specify a different user and get a different user's desktop folder. But if you're the current user and you're in your default work, working directory, which is your home directory, which is, is slash user slash username, all three of these will be exactly identical as far as where they where they are accessing um, when you're typing them into the command line, um, and that's important to know. Um, so if you wanted to do something where you're accessing the current user's desktop, you might use this right here. But if you want to specify in a particular user's desktop, you would use this down here. Uh, so there is a, a, a subtle difference in the way these commands work, but in the case that you are the current user and you're accessing your current user desktop, it will be equivalent. Uh, and this here, the, this bottom one, is called uh, an absolute path, which means its path is specified from root. So this is the root folder, and you're specifying a very precise path all the way up to the file uh, from root. Yes. Yeah, you're not going to be able to do, you're not going to be able to manipulate things. I, um, I'm more giving that perspective from uh, if you're an uh, administrator and you're acting as super user to affect various places on the machine, then you wouldn't be able to do that. But you're correct. As a uh, standard user, not using super user, then you are not going to be able to do that. If you use sudo, you can do anything you want, and including all the bad stuff. So there, there's nothing holding you back once you're a super user, um, and when and often when you're doing ARD, you can tell it to send commands as super user or, uh, and use sudo through that, and then you can destroy it as much as you want. <laughs> you can do all kinds of horrible things. Uh, any other questions about absolute versus relative paths? Uh, this is a fairly important concept, but it's it's pretty universal to command line. Should be applications. Well, the finder is usually already open because it's down there with a the little light on it, and you can't really quit it because it just kind of comes back. Um. Yeah, yeah. You you can do this. All right, let me close all the. From, we're getting towards the end here, so um, you can also do uh, Apple Script from the command line, which is super helpful, and uh, I can show you that now. So if I have a bunch of finder windows open, I can actually close them through this. And it'll close the finder windows without closing the finder. And you can actually just open the finder as well. 
If I just do tell finder, and that's that's what it'll do. No, that's not it. Yeah, I don't know this. I'm I'm not familiar with AppleScript too well, so I don't know the exact syntax for that. But through this OSA script uh, dash e, you can actually run AppleScript. So if you look up different Apple scripts, you can actually use those within the command line to do various tasks. And sometimes that is a sort of way around there not being a command for something. Yeah, I wanted to come back to the problem of uh, spaces. Now that we've gone through some of these commands, um, I was just giving that as a quick overview, but uh, does, anyone, does anyone have any questions about the spaces and escape characters and, and uh, special characters on the command line? Um, if, you, if you want... There are certain characters that have special meaning, and in order to actually use that as the actual character, you have to escape it. And space is one of the most important ones for that. So there are some times where um, a character will actually tell a command to do something a little bit differently, and you're not trying to do that. You're trying to use that as a part of the string that you're trying to specify, and you just use the escape character and hit enter, and then you're good to go. Uh, and that is really where this comes from. Uh, but that's also true of um, backslash, and there's a, probably many others. Um, the dash, I think, is one. There's, there's lots of special characters that you have to escape in order to actually specify them as a part of a string. And this becomes really important when you're using a script to tell the machine to, to run a command that it is then running a command. Like if you're embedding commands within commands, sometimes you then have to use escape characters to actually specify that character to then it show up for the command that you're trying to run. And then it's actually using that in a non-escape way. It gets very confusing when you're layering commands on command. Um, and escape characters are often a reason that your commands that you're trying to send aren't working because you either escape them incorrectly or escape them uh, did not escape them at all. Um, there's a lot of nuance to escape characters, uh, and it's definitely something that will trip you up. It should have the path, yes. Um, the other the other thing you can do is you can um, start typing um, something and hit tab. Uh, So if I type in CD and then like I start typing this, since uh, this is this is the only thing in this folder that starts with that, I can hit tab and it'll complete it home for me. So it puts the escape character in there um, a as I should see it, and it puts that little slash at the end to signify that it's a folder, not a file. And I can hit enter, and um, I'm now in that folder. So if I do this, it'll tell me. Uh, but yes, you're right. If you drag just about anything into the terminal, it will print it out as it should be escaped and everything to be correct. Um, so that is one trick if you're wondering, like, okay, so how do I actually specify this folder? Do that, and then you can see it. Like, oh, okay, now I kind of get the idea. The other thing you can do is sort of try to create a problem folder through the finder and then drag that in and look at what it looks like and kind of get an idea of, oh, that's what I was meaning to target and I wasn't actually doing it because I did not escape it properly. Uh, so that is a help. And it'll show up there. So here are some resources. Um, the ss64.org slash osx is um, uh, basically an online manual page for all of the Unix commands. So if you go there, um, it'll show you a list of the commands. You can click on it and then essentially see the man page for that command, which is uh, extremely helpful. Um, th this website also has um, a similar listing for, I believe, Windows and Unix and a whole bunch of other stuff um, available. So if you go to ss64.com, it'll show you all of those. Um, this really long, horrible link here is uh, Apple's version of the online man page. So they're, you know, not so good with the small URLs. 
in their um, CMS. Um, this will be available, so you don't really need to be writing this down. Uh, but you know, feel free if you really want. Um, Lynda.com is excellent tutorials, and if you happen to work for Penn State, we have free access to it. The rest of you may or may not, depending on your organization, or you could pay for it. Uh, but they have an, uh, an excellent tutorial on uh, going through the command line. Uh, it's very introductory, but it goes into a lot more detail than this talk um, did, that is for sure. Um, there are a few other like online ebooks and stuff like that. These start to get a little small here. Um, but if you uh, Google around, there's uh, a bunch of free uh, offerings that you can try to dive into the command line a little deeper. Okay, so it's like a way to explore the man pages, essentially, in like a gooey way. Hmm. That is helpful. They're also available through the terminal at any time. <laughs> uh, all right. All right, I'm going to run a command, a set of commands on your systems. Um, this script is going to run through and do a whole bunch of different uh, things. You might want to minimize any like Safari or um, uh, any other windows open and see your desktop. And um, this will actually do some things on your desktop, and you'll be able to see what it does uh, and kind of step through a bunch of things. Kind of give you an idea of like um, uh, possible automation type stuff. So this is only going to work on the... Uh, lab machine, so if you're not staring at a lab machine, you won't see it. And hopefully, and hopefully this will work. One of the computers not, I don't know why. So I don't know if you can see that. Oh, I can see it. I'm doing it right here. So if you can actually see your desktop, you'll actually see these changes happening. Which I cannot over here. So it's actually it's actually created folders. It created a file called uh, demo. It copied it over to demo two. It removed the original, moved the new one back to um, the original name, made a new directory, and then moved it into that new directory. So now it's going to be located in here. And you can actually watch that happen as it went through if you could see your desktop there, which I guess I should have shown by uh, moving that out of the way. I forget that this is actually a lab machine, just like all the others, so whenever I'm doing stuff over here, it also does it over here, and I did not realize that. Uh, which is actually kind of cool. How to make it go slow? Yeah, I put sleep two uh, in each one. So, um, th th this is sort of, this is sort of a demonstration of a way that you could do things through scripting. You would not do it this way. You would not normally make it open a terminal window and then do stuff in the terminal window. I'm kind of doing a weird cheat to make that happen. I'm actually running Apple Script to make, to make it do that. But through Apple Remote Desktop or similar utilities where you can send commands to a machine, you would send these kind of commands, but it would happen silently. The user would never see it. I'm actually not doing it that way just so that you can see it happen in front of you. Uh, so you could send commands like these and just affect all of the machines under your control at once which is really kind of handy. Uh, and I have used that extensively. Uh, it's very, very helpful. Uh, just to be able to send commands to remote machines. Um, so this is an, sort of an example of using something like ARD, which is what I am using, to send commands to many machines and do something all at once. And in this case, actually show it to you. But normally, it would just happen. And the user would never even know it, uh, which is maybe a little scary. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you, as um, as admins, you have a lot of control and a lot of power, and you got to use it responsibly. Uh, and it's 
better to do it with the user's knowledge than not, especially depending on what you're doing. Um, are there any other questions? Is there anything else you want me to demonstrate or go into, or any more commands you want me to explore? Something like that. A couple. Um, yes, so. So the, the touch command, what it does is it updates the access time and modification time of a file. But in the case that that file does not exist, then it creates it. So it's, it's, it's updating the access time and modification time of a file, and that's what it does. But if that file does not happen to exist, it still does it. In the process, it creates a file that doesn't, that's empty. Yes, you can create a file inside any folder. So if I um, make a directory on the desktop, and I uh, and then make directory like uh, directory, and then I say uh, touch demo.txt. Now it's going to be there, and if I say open dot, there it is. So I'm in desktop, new directory, now there's this demo dot. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, it, I could do it again, but it's not gonna, you're not going to see the time change here. Not through, not through touch. You would do that through um, the text editor, or um, you can use a command line text editor like VI, which I try to avoid, but it's there. Um, so, uh, another, another thing that I want to point out is that um, not only can you use something like ARD to send remote commands to machines, but if you have it enabled, you can also use what's called SSH, and you can remote into a machine and get a command line interface to that machine, and then be able to send commands to that machine remotely. Um, and that is also very powerful to get command line access, and that, and that is available on OS X and Linux and Unix and all that stuff. It does have to be enabled. Uh, ARD also has to be enabled. Uh, it's not enabled by default, I don't believe, in most cases, maybe on the server, but not de not on the desktop. Um, <clears throat> but if you have SSH enabled, you can use any, there's lots of different utilities that you can do SSH from and from the command line, and then you get a command line to another machine, uh, which is really fantastic. And you can do over extremely low bandwidth, so uh, SSH, Sending text-based commands back and forth to a machine requires almost no bandwidth whatsoever. Uh, it's what we used to do in the dial-up days to, like, you know, remote control a machine. Yeah. Uh, I believe there there is a way to do it with some of the GUI utilities I've used that use SSH, and there should be a way to do it through SSH. But yes. The defaults right, uh, com.apple.launchservices, ls quarantine bull, no, uh, actually, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. no, no, I can, I can do that. Yes. Okay, so the defaults right, defaults is a command that, that, um, does stuff with plist. It, it affects plist. That's what it's for. Um, write is saying I want to write into a plist. There's also read to read out from the plist. And then um, com.apple.launchservices is the particular plist that it's going to affect. There's like a default location where the plist uh, for preferences are stored. And it, it's saying look in that location because I'm not specifying a different location. And access that particular plist, com.apple.launchservice. So there's a com.apple.launchservice.plist in the in that directory uh, 
that it is telling it to access. And then ls quarantine is the location within that plist to access. And dash bool no is saying change the value of ls quarantine to no. So that, that's what's happening in that command. So you sort of go from like one side of the command to the other and sort of read it across. And, and it, it kind of like is going sort of down deeper and deeper and deeper into things uh, of what it's actually trying to accomplish. You would with other commands, but defaults only works with plists, really, so it assumes it's a plist. I believe you can add dot plist and it'll still work. Uh, I'm not 100% sure about that, but I know, but this is showing that you can not specify plist and it will assume it's a dot plist, uh, because that's what this command is specifically for. So you will find that there are commands that are for working for specific kinds of files and they will just make that assumption if you don't specify otherwise. It's kind of a, the idea is to have like a smart default so that most of the time you can leave it off, but if for some reason it's not the default, you can specify and do it differently. Mm -hmm. You you mean like a like a symbolic link, like a shortcut kind of thing? So you don't want to do a symbolic like hard link, you want to do like a soft alias type thing. Um, there should be a command for that. Um, I know I've made hard links that way, but... Um, yeah, I think you're right. Well, what is, what is the plan for that again? Yeah, there, there's, I mean, really the answer is there should be a way to do it, and I just Google around for it until I figure it out. <laughs> I mean, Google is your, definitely your friend. Um, you can usually... Uh, for anything that you need to do, it's probably already been done before, so look up how someone else did it and look at their scripts and figure out how to modify it or how to take the piece out of that that you need and uh, modify it for your use. But that's really difficult when you are not used to the command line in general or specific, or not used to the Unix command line. Uh, that, that's way more difficult uh, to do. But once you're a little bit more comfortable with it, you're a little more used to it, then it's easier to look at someone else's script and kind of get an idea of what it's doing and either use it identically or use it with slight modifications. So sometimes you might take someone else's script and take the server URL that they're using and swap it out for your server, for like your mail server, or, you know, whatever. So, some example like that. Um, so really what I would do is I would try to find online some way, you know, some way to make an alias through the terminal, and it would tell you. So there is an alias command. Yeah. Oh, what is it? Wait for that one. I think so. So this just comes up as a built in. Hmm. Yeah, the, other, the other reason that using the word alias is a bit confusing is because there's also command aliases where you, you could create a new command that is an alias for other commands. So if there's like a command that you type in frequently. So I'm worried that that's what that alias means and not the making a, a shortcut. I definitely don't know that right offhand um, to, to do that. Um, there, there are <clears throat> many other helpful commands out there. I just have a couple of examples. Ah, yeah. 
Here, here's one that affects the finder uh, over here. Defaults right com dot apple dot finder, and then it's fx show posix path in title bold yes. That uh, what that does is it tells the finder to display the entire path up here rather than just the current uh, folder. So if I actually take this. Place it in here. Um, and I should have to close the family. Oh, okay. Now it's back and it's got um, the full path here, which is very helpful if you're trying to figure out where you are through the finder. Uh, because it'll always list the exact path right here. Uh, so that's a, a plist editing command that you can do to sort of help yourself um, with scripting. All right, well, it looks like we're out of time.